On today's Retro Tech Repair, we're going to be repairing this Atari 65XE that I bought spares or repair on eBay. So we'll start straight off with the eBay listing on this one. Unfortunately, I lost the original listing. It's just been too long, but here's the summary. Atari 65XE games console spares or repair, 38 pounds plus shipping. I don't actually know if I even paid 38 pounds for it. I might have got it on a buy it now or, or an offer or something, which was a bit less than that. But anyway, that's roughly where we're at around 40 quid plus shipping. So I'm quite heavily into this. Now, of course, I didn't just get this. Let me zoom out a second. I also got the power supply and a cassette player and it, a ton of games uh, as how it was described. I seem to remember it, it said it came with a ton of games. Now, I went through these games on my unboxing video, a lot of them, and they are all 199 special kind of bargain games uh, silver range uh, a lot of the time. In fact, the three that I've picked at random are all from the silver 199 range. I think I got probably about a dozen, couple of dozen on those maybe. I don't know, maybe a dozen games. Uh, but they are all, you know, they were two quid when they were new. There's nothing of any value there. So really, what I got for my money was uh, this kind of tired looking Atari, uh, this grubby cassette deck which we know doesn't work, Actually, I think he said that in the listing, that didn't work. This was spares or repair, and the power supply. I think what I'm gonna do first of all is, we'll get the cable ties off of this, we'll take a look at the power supply, and we'll see if it's putting out its claimed voltages. So for anyone who doesn't remember, back in the 80s, if you bought an appliance, even the 90s, you bought an appliance in the UK, it didn't come with a plug. It's quite common uh, for you to just get the bare ends of the wire, you had to install your own plug. And so what that means is there are a lot of things flying around that have really in badly installed plugs with uh, the inappropriately sized fuse in. So we're going to open this up and see what's inside. Yes, what can I say? You know, I, I've seen worse. I think that's the best way to describe it, if we can focus on that. Uh, firstly, it does have the wrong size fuse in. These plugs are fused. It's got a 13 amp in. I'm sure it should be a 3, maybe a 5 amp. I'm almost certain it should be a 3. We'll look at the power supply. And um, that is input 240 volts at 0.11 amps. So actually, uh, yeah, the input voltage is 0.11 amps and it has a 13 amp fuse in it. So the lowest one that's commonly available is a 3 and that's what we should have in there. I'll pop one of those in before we power it up. And if you also see, uh, there's quite a lot of the conductor exposed on the positive terminal there. So we'll get that tidied up too. We'll get it assembled and we'll see what voltages are coming off our power supply. All right, so on this we see that we have uh, plus 5 volts on pins 4, 1 and 6 and ground on pins 5 three and seven. So it's only just, it's a, just a one voltage, five volt out supply. And it's really, really heavy. It must be a linear power supply, obviously quite a big one. Uh, just for comparison, I have a five volt power supply here, a modern one. As you see, it's all kind of plugs in. You can compare it to the size of the plug there. This claims an output of um, two amps, whereas this is 1.5 amps. So five volts at two amps, 5 volts at 1.5 amps and uh, I guess they don't make them like they used to. All right, so uh, let's take a look now at that cable and we'll just check to see if we're getting the voltage. I don't have a female, what is that, seven way in to connect it to. Yeah, so we're just gonna have to hold the multimeter probe up there and hope for the best. Looks like a one, four and six are down one side, five, three and seven are down the other. So I'm just gonna go across this with our meter across two of the pins there and hopefully we'll see five volts or close to it, 5.7, different two pins on that side, five and the other two, five. Okay, great, so we have five volts. This is doing its job. Probably time to plug it into the Atari, don't you think? Okay, so we're about to set up here. We have our old school CRT TV. This is a Matsui color. It's like a six inch TV. Very cool, this doesn't work great. Well, maybe one day I'll pluck up the courage to try and repair that, but it should be good enough to get an image of our XE, if our XE is in fact generating image. Before we go through and connect this up, I think it's important we should just take a quick look at this. So visually, 
it's tired, you know, it is tired. The keyboard's very yellow. I noticed there are a couple of keys which have no spring. Um, when I say no spring, I'm not sure what the mechanism of springing is in these, but there's no kind of return of the key from a press. So uh, the shift key particularly is kind of squished down and stuck down and the space bar similarly. Uh, I'm not familiar with the layout of this keyboard. Well, I know the layout, but I'm not familiar with the, how it's put together. So I can't say for sure what, what the problem with that is. Color, there's some discoloration obviously on the keys. These look like they have yellowed with time. The case itself probably isn't too bad, but it's very dirty uh, around the back. Uh, obviously some more scuff marks. I see the RF modulator is actually gone rusty, which is the first time I've ever seen anything like that. Uh, but we have a power switch, a power input, which we know to be five volts, a television output, which we're going to try and use today, a monitor output, which uh, I will probably resort to if I can't get the modulator to work. It's nice that it has a monitor output. Hopefully that gives out a composite signal, which we can connect up to a modern TV, which would be great. Uh, there's a cartridge slot. I don't have any cartridges, an expansion port. I don't have any expansion ports. And then the peripheral, um, which is where I'm going to connect the cassette deck, which I think also uh, doesn't work. Uh, on the back, it's pretty tidy. You know, just a few uh, four screws holding everything together there. They're not security screws by the look of it. So we should be able to get in there when and if we need to, and I'm sure we'll need to. Uh, but in the meantime, let's hook this up to the TV and see if we can get anything out of it at all. Okay, we're connected up. We have power, and for the first time in goodness knows how long, this is about to be switched on. No, nothing. In fact, so there's a power LED here, and even that uh, hasn't eliminated. All right, so there's a very faint red LED, but really doesn't light properly until I uh, uh, until I switched it off, and I just caught a glimmer of it. There we go. It's back. It's back, and then it's gone, and then it's back. It's like the switch is uh, is a bit sensitive. So we put it on as I'd expect, nothing, and then as I go to turn it off, I think it comes on. So I think that's on. I think that's on now. Let's see if we can get a signal on the TV. So we did manage to get a signal on the TV, but unfortunately, because of the synchronization issues between a cathode ray tube display and my camera, I wasn't able to show you that on the video. So you'll just have to take my word for it. Another thing you'll have to take my word for is the fact that when I actually got that signal and tried to type on the keyboard, a number of the keys didn't work properly. So now we'll rejoin the video the next day. So it's now the next working day and I wanted to take a look at this in case I needed to order some parts because that way I can get the order in and uh, get this repaired just as quickly as possible. Let's see how this comes apart. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Oh, pretty rusty in there, huh? I need to clean that up. Looks like it's been kept somewhere pretty damp. I think maybe this just lifts out. Does it? There's a ribbon cable underneath. There we go. That's now come free. It looks like it has carbon tracks, which aren't that easy to repair. Um, while I'm here, I might need to order a new switch. So I need to figure out how that switch works. Um, but we'll start off by maybe cleaning the one that is there. Let's see if we can get that to work. I remove the keycap, just gently prising it up off this key that was stuck. And it turns out that it has a little hinge mechanism with it. That hinge mechanism is heavily covered in rust. The spring that was there uh, is intact and was there, but it didn't have the strength spring force to overcome uh, that rust on that hinge there. So we'll go ahead and get that cleaned up and uh, maybe we'll do some other cleanup on the keyboard as well. I've decided I think I really want to get this Atari cleaned up. This is a repair, not a restoration video, but at the same time, you know, I do often sell these things that I buy on eBay. I do sell them when I've repaired them, not for profit because by the time I've paid a paid eBay fees and everything else, I nearly always lose money. Uh, and oftentimes I just pay more for them than they are worth in the first place because I buy stuff that I think is interesting and I want to see on the channel anyway. But I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put some IPA on this switch first of all and just work it back and forth a bit and see if I can get that to, uh, to free up. All right, very good. So we'll pop that aside a second. So what I had done previously is I'd foolishly tried to prise this keycap off when it was still in the enclosure and I actually cracked it. So given that I'd broken this the first time, 
I actually invested it in a little tool. Yeah, this is it. And I'm now going to use this to, to hopefully pull off a keycap. So if, see if it works. This was like a, is a, a, a couple of quid on eBay. There we go. All right, and I get a keycap and a spring. Because I don't normally do this, because this is, a, you know, I do repair videos, not restoration videos, but this is really quite it's filthy. So I really need to get this cleaned up. But I'm not going to make you sit through that as I uh, systematically pull off these keycaps. If anything happens during that journey, I will let you know. So the 8-bit guy never says this when he's doing this. I'm still on the first row. This is really dull. It's taking me ages. It's taking me ages to do this. The voice is still really boring. Okay, so several tedious minutes later, uh, tens of minutes, we now have uh, got all the kind of normal keys, if that's the right word, off. Uh, hopefully you can see that's extremely grimy. There's kind of three kind of conventional looking keycaps in the middle and one spring. Okay, yeah, there we go. There's only one kind of keycap engagement and that's in the center there. Uh, so that's the one you need to go either side of and just prise it up with a screwdriver. The spring looks to be different to all the others. I was just about to throw it in there. Yeah, but it's definitely a stiffer spring to the others. Uh, I'm not quite sure how I uh, record and identify that, uh, but certainly I need to. So I think I'll probably put a bit of tape around that or something just to kind of remind me that that one is... Uh, that one is the special one for the space bar. So with that now identified, I'm just gonna prise out this kind of metal piece here. And again, just break that metal free and you can see all that's really very unpleasant. Very, very pleasant, lots of hair. All right, so then I need to try and get these other keys off and these are obviously a little bit different. I'm quite sure how they're going to work, so uh, but uh, we'll just try the key puller again in some kind of, uh, if we can get it over there. Okay, I'll go over in some fashion, let's try it. Oh yeah, right off. And again, I don't know if these springs... Yeah, they may just be slightly different. So again, we'll just identify these separately when we... Uh, when we store them as well, just in case they are different from the others. Okay, so I've cleaned all of that off, and that even now as I'm just kind of hitting on these, you can see just this dirt coming out. I mean, it's just awful. So uh, I'll carry on. I think I'll probably brush that off with a, an old paintbrush or something, get that off, and then uh, we'll start disassembling it from the top. I think there's 20 of these I counted or something like that, so I'm not going to force you to sit and watch all of that. I'll join you in a second when I've undone all these. So let's take a look then and see if we can find our keyboard membrane. And there it is. And we can see it's a uh, Mitsumi keyboard membrane. Like I say, I think there were different versions of this. Yeah, there was an LED I spied in here somewhere. I don't know where that was mounted. Oh, it looks like it also mounts via a kind of carbon pad. The way these work is there's a little carbon pad on the bottom of the key cap. When you press on the key cap, it presses down that carbon pad and it shorts together, uh, presumably, two of these little tracks here. Uh, some of the reason it doesn't work probably is that you know there's all this stuff inside it that is not that is not going to help but also you do find that uh, you lose some of these tracks and there's a lot of corrosion and stuff on here so uh, the first thing we're going to do is get these put somewhere safe and then we'll take a look at this keyboard membrane so I'll pop that aside gently tip this over and I expect that all or most of them will uh, will fall out probably 
Oh, okay, we got those popped away somewhere safe. So hopefully we won't lose any of those. And what we need to do now is get this just basically washed off in a bowl of soapy water. And I'll probably do that with the keycaps in a few minutes. And uh, then we'll take a look at this membrane and see what we can do with this too. And you can buy replacement membranes. So we can do that if we have to. But in the first instance, I just want to make sure that this thing is clean. And, uh, and if there are any tracks, maybe we could repair if there's just one or two tracks that have failed. So we've just separated our keyboard membrane now. As I say, it's a Mitsumi keyboard membrane. You can buy replacements, I believe. Uh, but in the first instance, it doesn't look in too bad condition. It's not delaminated. It is really dirty. So I'm going to get this cleaned up and maybe we can just kind of buzz it out and see if it's working. Okay, so I do see quite a lot of corrosion on here. I don't know if you can see that from here. Uh, the membrane, there's just some uh, quite a lot of corrosion. It sounds kind of rough over here. Maybe you can pick it up on the sound. Um, that's pretty nasty. I I'm nervous about cleaning this with IPA because I don't know what it is. It looks like it's printed on maybe and then kind of laminated over. Um, the pads certainly are exposed. You probably can't tell it on the camera, but the pads are exposed, whereas the tracks are not. Um, but as I say, I'm nervous. So at this point, I decided to clean off the tracks with some IPA, and I discovered that in fact there were breaks in the tracks. So I decided to try and repair those with some conductive paint. As you will see, that didn't go particularly well. So it took me a while to mask that off. It's an easy track because it's close to the edge, but it still took me quite a few minutes to mask that off. I'm going to try painting some of this conductive paint on there, leaving it to dry and then peeling the masking tape away. If that doesn't work, then I've really got no chance of repairing these other tracks, which are actually more intricate than this one I'm trying to get here. So I might just need to order another membrane for this if I can find one. Uh, but I'm going to try and repair this one for the time being. Okay, so that's the first one. It's really clumsy. Yeah, I, I just don't think this is going to work. Just the precision isn't there to repair this. So I shot this footage a little while ago, and since then I've repaired a couple of other things that had membranes with broken tracks. And the approach that I used on the new things was to kind of cover the whole area that was affected with the silver conductive paint, give it overnight to dry, and then go in and scrape away those bits that I didn't need. Perhaps if I'd done that, I'd have had more success with this repair. But on this one, I took a slightly different direction. So I've ordered another keyboard membrane from eBay. Um, don't know how much of this you can see, but I'm sure I've showed you it a bunch of times by now. All of these tracks here have just corroded away, and uh, I've tried to restore them with a, a pen, but they're just too fine and detailed for me to put a conductive pen, and the damage is just too much. So unfortunately, despite the fact the rest of this membrane looks pretty good, I am going to have to replace this. So I've ordered a new one. I think it's about £25, so it was quite expensive. Uh, I don't make any money on these repairs anyway, but by the time I've added the cost of that, I'll probably end up with something that uh, cost me more than I could have bought a working one for. But I will have the satisfaction of knowing that it's got a new membrane in it. Plus, you know, I've kept this out of landfill, and that's very important. Uh, so what I'm going to do in the meantime, then, is I'm just going to go ahead and get the rest of this cleaned up. And there we go, so seven screws secure it to the lower enclosure. And again, you can see there's a lot of rust here on the screen. Um, I'd need to remove that screen to be able to clean underneath. And then the enclosure itself is, uh, is pretty grimy too. Okay, so let's see if we can open this up and see what's inside. There are just some little twist tabs on the end of the screen here. I just want to show you those. There's a couple at the back here that are extremely rusty. And then hopefully that's enough now to shimmy this out of place. There we are, that should do it. All right, but the board itself is extremely dirty, so we'll get that cleaned up. Uh, there's a piece of, uh, looks like a piece of string in here. A couple of hand mods, which are probably factory. Um, oh, there's room for some extra RAM there. I understand you can upgrade this to be basically a 130 XE, is it? Uh, but there are some additional modifications you need to make. I think you need to put uh, this controller in here and some other things. 
Um, some microprocessor, video driver, ROM, RAM, I'm sure, and some ULAs, probably. A whole load of resistors, a lot of resistors on that board. A little timer circuit there as well. Um, the capacitors look to be in reasonably nice condition. I don't see anything going on there. There's a couple of dead insects that we need to get rid of, and uh, a lot of dog hair, and uh, obviously some string. Interestingly, let's see if underneath is free now. Great. And then underneath, actually, the solder side of the printer circuit assembly looks quite nice. I don't see anything too bad on there. Uh, there's no big solder residue, maybe a little bit around here. I don't see any rework or handwork or anything like that. So that is looking pretty good. All right, so really we just need to get the top cleaned up, uh, get this modulator casing cleaned up as best we can, and then um, we'll get the plastics cleaned up. But I think we're gonna do the plastics first. And we're gonna start out, I think, by uh, cleaning the keyboard pieces. So as I painstakingly clean the plastic pieces, I'd just like to thank you for watching the video today and ask that if you are enjoying the video, or even if you're not, that you leave a comment in the comments section below and let me get some feedback that I can use to improve the channel going forward. I read all of your comments and respond to most of them. And if you're really enjoying the video, perhaps you'll consider hitting subscribe. Subscribers make a huge difference to the channel. I'm always excited to get a new subscriber. And if you pop down into the comments section and leave me a comment saying what you'd like to see more of in the channel, I'll do my level best to oblige. But for now, let's return to our repair. And at last, they're finally done. They're still a bit soapy, but they're clean. They're a bit yellow though, aren't they? All right, so we have all our pieces in now. I'm probably just gonna have to wrap this one in cling film before we put it out in the sun because it doesn't really fit in one of these boxes. Uh, but for now, I think I'm just going to keep these for the time being, just as they are, and I'm going to put some peroxide on them on a sunnier day and put them outside, because I'm gonna to have to wait a few days for the keyboard matrix to arrive anyway. So we're back now to cleaning up the outer enclosure, and so we're back to our uh, bowl of soapy water. I don't think I'm going to go to the trouble of, uh, of retrobriting this. And again, I'm gonna save you the agony of having to watch me clean it. Okay, so that all cleaned up pretty nicely. A couple of things I'm a bit disappointed with. I just caught the edge of the Atari logo when I was scrubbing it with the kind of scouring pad and just took a little bit of the paint off. That's a bit of a shame. Uh, on the back, I left the label in place as I put it in the soapy water and that soaked behind the label a bit. I'm hoping that might dry out. Obviously the paint isn't gonna grow back on the front, but overall, uh, I'm pretty pleased with that. I cleaned up the keyboard uh, backer, so we'll put that all together when that comes back and we get the matrix in place and uh, everything should hopefully uh, hopefully be good then. But for now, we'll turn our attention back to the kind of mechanicals. And I've got some newspaper down here, finest edition of the Scarborough News. And we're going to take a look at, see if we can do something with these, uh, with these rusty parts here. Um, again, this is a repair video, not a restoration video. So uh, I don't expect to see this being painted or anything like that. I'm just gonna take the surface corrosion off, uh, maybe put a bit of WD-40 on it or something, uh, just to try and keep it a little bit more rust resistant than it is currently. Ultimately in time, it will re-rust. That's the nature of these things. Unless I paint it, that's what it's going to do. But for now, I'm just gonna get it cleaned up. So what I'm doing at the moment is just taking the surface corrosion off with some fairly coarse sandpaper. And we're gonna go ahead and do the same to the bottom screen here as well. This isn't rusted quite as badly, but uh, I think it'll benefit from a quick rub down. Lightly spray with some WD-40, like I say, it would be uh, better to paint it, but I don't have any paint. I don't know how well that comes out on the camera, although it is rusty. It is uh, definitely uh, protected, it's smooth, and it's not coming off on your hands any longer when you rub it, so it's so certainly a lot better than it was. Okay, so next up for our cleaning is the printed circuit assembly. I'm gonna start by trying to take the top off this modulator here and see if we can give it a similar kind of treatment to the one that we gave the, uh, the enclosure. I've left the lid off our modulator just uh, we'll clean that with a uh, the IPA and the cotton bud as I clean this up. I'm going to do largely with a toothbrush and then kind of clean up with a cotton bud just to get the dirt off of this printed circuit assembly. And it will give me a chance to take a good look at it as well as I'm doing that. 
save your time and uh, my memory card. I'm going to pause it a second and come back to you when I finish this off. So with that all cleaned off now, it uh, came off pretty nicely. I think if there's any problems when I reassemble this, I will go ahead and look at cleaning specific areas. But it's just a general clean with some IPA. Uh, I'm quite happy with the way that turned out. In fact, the, the back needed very little work at all. Mainly I just cleaned the surface here with the IPA and the toothbrush. And it's come up to a point where I'm comfortable enough that we can reassemble it, put it into the computer and hopefully uh, fire it up and see if it works. Okay, so a couple of days have passed. It's finally a sunny day. So what I'm going to try and do is about seven o'clock in the morning, I'm going to get some hair brightener on these yellowed plastic pieces. I'm going to get them sat out in the sun and, the, and whatever they look like at the end of the day is what they're going to look like. I'm not going to spend a lot of time repairing this or restoring the color on this. It's a one-time deal. So let's see what a day of, you know, spring British sunshine and some hair brightener will do to these yellowed plastics. So after a couple of days of finest North Yorkshire sunshine, this is what we've ended up with. I'm going to get these cleaned off now. I uh, didn't reapply any of this. I just put them out in the sun, sat them out. Um, one day of daylight, one day of sun, um, or maybe half a day of daylight, half a day of sun. And um, this is what they have turned into. So we'll get them cleaned up and we'll see what they look like. So quite a lot of time has passed since I last looked at our Atari. And that isn't because it took me a long time to get parts, it's because a lot of other things were going on. I had my uh, the room that I do my repairs in, refurbished, redecorated, and a little bit more workspace. So you may have seen the, the backdrop has changed colour here. I'm not so cramped as I was before, although it is still a very small space. One thing that happened was I had this delivery and this actually happened quite quickly. Didn't take a long time to come, and this is a replacement keyboard matrix. I paid quite a lot of money for this, I think 30 euros, something like this, so certainly this was not a cheap purchase. I won't make any money on this repair, uh, but as you see, this came from retronics.eu. Retronics.eu, don't know if you can make that out. Not affiliated with me in any way, uh, but they deserve credit for continuing to make membranes for Atari 65 XEs. Um, so here is our Atari 65 XE, and the next thing we're going to do now is get this stripped down and get our lovely membrane here installed in the keyboard. So what is nice is that although quite a lot of time has passed, our kind of WD-40 uh, insulation screen here is uh, still pretty much as it was when I left it, obviously not pristine, uh, but with no new rust form that I could tell, and, uh, and no rust coming off on your hand as you interact with it. So. I would say that that was a pretty reasonable kind of thing to do, uh, just to keep this in, in usable condition. Anyway, so we'll pop that aside and we'll take a look at this keyboard. Okay, so here's our keyboard and our new keyboard matrix. Here is our old one and it's just a case, hopefully, of taking this out. You can see where we have lost the tracks there and, uh, and put the new one in. Okay, it looks to be a pretty good fit. We'll slide this through. Now, unfortunately, because so long has passed, I cannot quite remember how this keyboard went back together. So I'm actually now going to have to refer back to some of the earlier video and take a look. So I didn't manage to quickly find the video, but what I did find is this collection of uh, keyboard pieces. And I think that these just drop in here, like so, or something like so. And then on the other side is where the spring goes and the keycap. So I'm just going to load all of these up now one by one. And here we have our LED. I don't know if you can see that, but that actually connects onto the uh, bent LED wires and there's a little carbon contact on there also, which I think goes onto this contact on the keyboard. And probably it looks like it mounts in here somehow. I'm not quite sure quite how that goes in, but uh, that seems to be the location. There we go. Hopefully that's right. It certainly feels it. So now we need to put all this back together with our new membrane in place and uh, hope for the best. Mm. 
Okay. And there we have it. Actually, it would be this way around, I think, because I think this is the space bar. Hopefully that's okay, because uh, I've no more screws, and uh, I'm hoping that's gonna do. So now we have to put the springs on and the keycaps. And also there's a couple of uh, mechanical pieces in here as well, uh, just for the larger keys, I think. So I'm hoping that now all we have to do is put everything back together. So let's see how that works. Well, pushing that connector in, it does seem to line up with all of the pins there. Or well, pushing that ribbon in does seem to line up with all of the connector pins, I should say. It's no easy way to figure out quite how it's supposed to fold, so we'll just have to hope for the best with regard to that, I think. I suppose I should check that this works first, but I'm going to trust to look. So I do have our Atari hooked up to a TV now, but the more observant amongst you may have noticed that actually I got some of these keys in the wrong place, so let's go ahead and correct that right away. Now we have a QWERTY keyboard. So we've got everything hooked up now, power supply. I actually have a uh, composite cable into the TV, so let's power it on and see if it goes. Hmm. Oh, let's try the diagnostic. So you may or may not know, uh, but the Atari has a uh, built-in self-test. Um, so let's try, now we'll don't do memory first because memory takes a little bit of time. So let's try a different one, uh, audio-visual. So I suppose it goes through each of the voices. I think there are three. That seemed to work, and of course, the picture works as two, which is great. Oh, maybe there are four voices, better still. Okay, and it seems to be repeating, so I will escape that. Somehow, okay, and then the all important keyboard test. Let's try the keyboard test. So select to get to keyboard, and then start. Okay. Yeah, so everything there seems to work. Memory test is the only thing that's remaining. That will take a, t a few minutes, I think, so we'll start that going. So that seems to be going okay, so let's connect it up to this Atari XC12 cassette deck and see if we can load a game. Now, I only have one game, and that's Centipede, so let's see how that goes. So there we have it, our perfectly functioning Atari 65XE. I've really enjoyed this repair and I'm very, very happy with the result. Through the time that I've been working on it and owning it, this Atari 65XE has really grown on me, perhaps more than any computer that I've ever owned or repaired before. And that includes the Amstrad CPC, the ZX Spectrum, the TI-99-4A, and dare I say it, even the Commodore 64. All this is from an architecture which was launched in 1979, three years before the Commodore 64, and which remained in use essentially with the same features and functions right up until 1992. I think a very strong testament to the quality of this product. But that really does just about wrap it up for our Atari 65 XE for today. I hope you've enjoyed watching the video as much as I enjoyed making it, and until next time, I'd just like to thank you so much for watching Retro Tech Repair.